Thanks a lot. So um, this is uh, the last session before lunch, so you've almost made it. Um, before, I want to talk about um, the latest features in uh, Flink 1.3, so the latest official release, and give you some insights on um, what the community is currently working on and what can be expected for 1.4 and um, beyond. Um, so this one is... No, it works. All right. So let me quickly say some words on behalf of my employer. So um, for those of you who have missed it, Data Artisans is uh, the company founded by the original creators of Apache Flink and is um, providing the DA platform too by now, which includes um, open source Flink and um, the DA application man manager, which you most likely have seen in the uh, opening keynote and in a previous presentation here in Kesselhaus. All right, what can you expect from this presentation? So first of all, I want to tell you what, uh, well, what cool features are included in Flink 1.3, in case you haven't noticed yet. Um, then I want to um, well, highlight some of the 1.4 features and give you an outlook on what's uh, happening uh, or might happen afterwards. So what's uh, on our minds um, where we are working on. All right. Let's start with what happened so far. Um, first, I want to take, uh, take a look at um, the 1.3 release in, in numbers. Um, so about 141 contributors uh, helped making the uh, 1.3 release. Um, side note, I didn't do any ID applications, so it might be a bit um, fewer contributors, um, but it should be around 120, I guess. Um, a total of 1,400 commits went into the 1.3 release. Um, more than 680 resolved Jira issues. So not every commit had a Jira issue, as uh, would have been perfect, but we're working on that as well. Um, a total of 260,000 lines were added, and about 65,000 were, were removed. Um, and at the bottom, you see when our contributors were most active uh, committing things. Um, yeah, that's actually quite impressive, I think. So um, let's first take a look at how we improved uh, Flink's uh, APIs with uh, the 1.3 release uh, in order to, to, honest, well, to get a better understanding for uh, the APIs. I want to give you a quick uh, historical background on um, the evolution of Flink's APIs. So back in the days when we released Flink 1.0, we um, was the first time it included the state API, which basically allowed um, the user to, to develop stateful um, stream processing applications. Um, with Flink 1.1, um, session windows and support for late arriving events uh, were released. In Flink 1.2, the um, well, a lower level API, what we call the process functions, has been uh, introduced, which gives you access to, to the events, to, to state and timers. And it's basically the foundation to um, build uh, nowadays event uh, driven applications on top of Flink. And with 1.3, uh, we added site outputs and access to per window state, which um, further evolved the, the API. Here, I want to highlight um, the, the site outputs. Um, the site outputs um, are basically, I give you the opportunity to, to add um, more outputs to a process functions. Um, the important part here is that um, these site outputs can have a completely different type than the main output, which makes it uh, actually valuable. These site outputs could, for example, be used to, to emit um, late arriving events, which you don't want to silently drop. Um, or if you do in your process function some, for example, input uh, parsing, um, and some of your, your incoming events might contain corrupted data, which you uh, want to record for later auditing purposes, um, these could also be outputted by, uh, onto a separate um, um, site output. So these site outputs basically allow you to, um, to develop um, um, Flink applications in a, in a bit nicer way than, than before and gives you more expressiveness with respect to the APIs. Um, 
<coughs> one of the key distinctive um, features of uh, Flink is its um, support for state that allows you to, to um, develop stateful uh, applications which uh, can, can be much much uh, more sophisticated than, than simple stateless applications. And part of it is also the way um, Flink handles large state. And here again, I want to give you a quick um, background on how the, the uh, large state handling in Flink evolved. Um, so in Flink 1.0, um, that was the first time we introduced the, the WoxDB um, state backend, which basically gives support for um, out-of-course state um, in Flink. With Flink 1.1, um, we made this WoxDB state backend fully asynchronous, which means that all the checkpointing operations uh, happened fully asynchronously without um, blocking the, the, process, um, the, the main processing thread. In Flink 1.2, the keyed and non-partitioned state, which is now called the operator state, um, uh, became rescalable. And now we added uh, incremental checkpoints and fine-grained recovery. Um, fine-grained recovery basically um, means that, that in case of a failure, uh, if possible, only parts of the um, execution graph are restarted. So it's not uh, a single task. Failure won't trigger necessarily um, a complete um, failover of the complete execution graph. And incremental checkpoints is what I want to talk about now. So in order to, to see the benefits of uh, incremental checkpoints, let's first take a look at um, how full checkpoints are performed in Flink. So as the name indicates, whenever um, you draw a checkpoint in Flink, um, you, you checkpoint the complete state of an operator. So here, uh, at checkpoint time one, uh, we have four key value pairs, pairs and we, we uh, checkpoint all of them. So in between checkpoint one and two, we added um, a fifth key value pair. And now when, when the checkpoint is triggered, we write out five key value pairs to our persistent store. Uh, and um, this continues at checkpoint time three. We even have one more, um, even though um, we only, like if you compare checkpoint one and checkpoint two, um, we, we actually only changed the, the key with the red value. We uh, changed it from B to V, th its value, and added um, a fifth key value pair. Um, so even though we only touched two key value pairs, we uh, had to checkpoint five uh, key value pairs, which um, um, means that we, we are doing redundant work. Uh, and uh, in order to improve that, to make it more efficient, um, uh, we w would only have to, to um, checkpoint like the, the touched or modified uh, key value pairs. That's actually what, what incremental checkpoints are all about. So um, incremental checkpoints um, basically checkpoint the delta compared to the previous um, successful checkpoint. So when you start um, taking a checkpoint, well, then you don't have a previous uh, checkpoint, so you have to, to checkpoint um, all four key value pairs. But now, when the second checkpoint is triggered, uh, you basically take a look at which states, uh, state pairs have been touched uh, or which other uh, or which key value pairs have been added, and only those are, um, are checkpointed. Um, and that way, by only checkpointing these deltas and writing these deltas to, to um, a pers persistent store, the, the checkpointing operation itself is, is much faster um, and, and more efficient. Additionally to the, to the delta files, of course, uh, every checkpoint now has to record uh, the, the checkpoints on which it re relies to, to restore the full set of all key value pairs. Um, that's the the um, complexity uh, you add by, by having incremental checkpoints. So how this looks like uh, is the following. We have our um, persistent store where we write our data files to, and we have our, um, our checkpoints where we record the dependencies so on which um, data files each checkpoint relies. So for the first, um, Checkpoint, we see that it only relies on the, on the chunk file one. The second checkpoint 
um, relies on well on the chunk file one and um, the delta compared to the first checkpoint, which is recorded in C2, the chunk file two. Um, now, it could be the case that um, between checkpoint two and checkpoint three, you basically only touched key value pairs which were um, um, recorded in C2, such that you don't have, a, uh, have to rely on C2 in order to restore the full um, state again. So you only have a dependency on C1 and C2, and, and so on. And um, that's more or less uh, on a high level how, how it uh, internally works. And um, these, these data files um, are cleaned up once uh, you no longer have a checkpoint which uh, reference um, this, this checkpoint file. Um, all right, the incremental checkpointing is currently supported uh, for, for the RocksDB state backend. Um, and it's, well, in a nutshell, it it's makes you, uh, your checkpoint faster and smaller. We had a um, production user reporting actually what, what's, what are the effects or the improvements uh, of this incremental checkpointing uh, mechanism. And as you can see, um, size wise, like a full checkpoint in, in his production case uh, had a size of about 60 gigabytes. Uh, it could be decreased to 1 to 30 gigabytes. So depending on the access pattern between um, two, two uh, checkpoints, um, you have to, to checkpoint more or um, fewer key, key value pairs. That's why, why the size um, varies as well. And um, time-wise, uh, we could decrease the, the checkpointing time from 180 seconds, so three minutes, to Three to thirty seconds, which is um, quite a benefit you have. Um, you, you, you get by by using the incremental checkpoints. <coughs> if you want to learn more about how, uh, like more details about how incremental checkpointing works, um, and also how we we made the the heap state backend um, fully asynchronous, meaning that also I'm um, taking a check checkpoint with the uh, heap state back backend no longer blocks the the main processing thread then uh, I can highly recommend the talk, a look at Flink's internal data structures and algorithms for efficient checkpointing by Stefan Richter, which um, takes place tomorrow at 12.20 p.m. in the machine house, which is uh, over there. Um, that's going to be like a really nice talk, a bit more technical, uh, but I think really interesting. All right. So now we've talked about uh, large um, state handling. But Flink comes also with a lot of uh, higher level APIs, higher level abstractions, uh, on which we worked for 1.3 as well. So again, some, some uh, historical background. So with Flink 1.0, um, the Flink CEP library was introduced, as well as the first version of the table API. This table API was uh, completely reworked with Flink 1.1 and um, now integrated with Apache Calcite uh, for the SQL optimization. Flink 1.2 extended the, the um, functionality of what the table API can do, so it added tumbling, sliding, and session group windows uh, to it. And in 1.3, we um, improved the expressiveness of CUP. We made the CUP operator uh, rescalable and added uh, retractions, among other things, to the table API and Stream SQL, which is a requirement for dynamic tables. There's also a dedicated talk for, for, for that, actually. Here, I only want to, to highlight the um, CUP improvements, so especially the, the um, improvements for the CUP pattern language. So what, what uh, was done is um, um, the community added um, quantifiers to, to the um, pattern language, which allow you to, um, to basically tell, like, like, um, um, tell that um, certain parts of your, of your defined pattern can, can occur uh, multiple times or can be optional. Like uh, if, you, if you wish, it's uh, similar to what you can do with regular expressions like Clinistar, the, the optional operator, and one time or more. Then um, we added iterative conditions. Um, so when, whenever you specify a pattern, you can also you, you, um, basically specify which events match to, to which stage of your pattern. 
um, by defining a filter condition. And this filter condition previously could only um, compute or um, only had, had the context of the, the current event you've received. With iterative conditions, what you can do now is you can uh, refer to, to previously matched uh, events in the sequence. And that way you can basically um, calculate aggregates, for example, uh, if, you, if your events carry a value. And depending on, on this aggregated value, you can say whether it matches or not, which gives you much more expressiveness and uh, more powerful, um, or you can, can match more, more sophisticated, more complex patterns. And last but not least, we introduced the not operator, which basically lets you tell that you don't want to see this event in, in your pattern, um, which is also nice. And a much more in-depth talk about this is uh, complex event processing with Flink, the state of Flink CP by Costas Kludas, uh, which, is, uh, which will be given today at 2.30 p.m. in the machine house. So if you want to learn more about what's possible with Flink CP, please go there. Uh, it's going to be a really, really interesting talk. <coughs> All right, so much for the past. What's happening now? So what are the, the upcoming features in Flink 1.4? Um, maybe a short disclaimer, also for all the sections I present, it's, this list is by no means complete. So uh, it's just a subset of the features uh, I'm presenting here. One of the bigger um, uh, working threads in Flink 1.4 is that we currently uh, rework a bit the network stack. Um, the network stack is working really well but there are two shortcomings which we try to solve with um, 1.4. One of them is that we want to add event-driven I.O. Uh, well, in order to understand what this, or why we do this, um, let me quickly explain how, how it currently works when data, when, when data is sent between two task managers. So whenever data is sent between two task managers, the, the data is um, first buffered um, or accumulated in, in some kind of buffer, and the data is only flushed after this buffer is full, or if um, a timeout um, occurred. Um, the, the latter thing is, is uh, important, because in cases like in a lo slow uh, or low throughput um, scenario, where you only have few elements uh, being sent, it can take quite some while to complete the buffer. Um, that's basically uh, avoided by having a timeout which uh, triggers the flushing. However, this also, exactly in the same low throughput scenario, um, adds a kind of um, artificial um, lower bound on your, on your latency. So you won't get faster than this um, uh, timeout um, with respect to sending events to your downstream um, operators. And that's where this event-driven I.O. Um, should help us. So the idea is to listen on the TCP events um, and whenever the TCP uh, connection tells you there's some capacity left, send as much bytes as possible um, to the downstream operator. That way, we guarantee um, or try to, to uh, achieve maximum resource utilization as well as um, a really good latency behavior. Because whenever there's capacity left, you send data downstream. Um, another um, improvement of the, the network stack is the um, application level flow control. Um, so currently, <coughs> Flink relies on TCP's uh, receive window mechanism to um, back pressure individual TCP connections. This works fine so far. However, it has the drawback that um, internally Flink's multiplexes um, multiple logical channels <coughs> into the same TCP connections. So assume you have um, multiple tasks, like let's say you have two tasks running on one task manager, and they both want to send data to um, task on uh, which run on a different, um, but on the same uh, different um, task manager. When these two tasks send data, um, the data is basically sent to the same uh, TCP connection. Um, the problem now is that if only one of these um, these logical channels uh, is back pressured um, or needs back pressure, um, the um, the complete TCP connection is back-pressured, and um, consequently, also the other uh, logical um, um, channel receives back-pressure, even though um, it's not necessary. 
So with, with having an application level flow control mechanism, mechanism where you assign um, capacities to, to the um, individual channels, you can control that by simply um, picking the, the channel, which should be back pressured and no, long, no, no longer giving him um, 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 credits. And this will basically improve um, well, the, the back pressure control and um, checkpoint alignment. There's a talk about um, this on the event-driven um, I.O., which is called Building a Network Stack for Optimal Throughput, uh, Low Latency Trade-offs by Nico Kuba. And it's going to be given today at 2 p.m. at Palais Atelier if you want to learn more about it. Next thing we are doing is uh, we want to, to add a new deployment model uh, to 1.4. So approximately a year ago, we started uh, reworking Flink's distributed architecture because we've seen that, that people use um, Flink in, in many different uh, deployment scenarios. And there were some, some deficiencies uh, in, in the current code. Um, uh, with respect to deployment, which we try to solve by, by um, uh, well, reworking the, dis the distributed components. So what we have now is we have um, um, building blocks, which can be easily, easily be plugged together to uh, fulfill the requirements of um, all kinds of different uh, deployment scenarios. Let it be, for example, Jan, Mesos, um, Kubernetes, um, running long, uh, long running, uh, running job clusters or running um, session clusters to which you submit multiple jobs. And this will be addressed by, by um, this um, rework. And moreover, it will add support for dynamic scaling, which will make Flink finally fully resource uh, elastic. So uh, it can basically allocate new resources and, and also freeze resources, which is no longer needs. <coughs> There's a talk, a related talk to this, um, called Flink on Containerland, where uh, Patrick Lucas tells you a bit about uh, what you can already do with Flink when running it in a container environment, what the lessons uh, learned, uh, what, what, which lessons he learned there, and what pitfalls to avoid. Um, so if you want to learn more about that, please go there. All right, another cool feature, uh, or cool connector we add uh, to Flink 1.4 is, um, the Kafka O11 connectors. And there, especially the um, Kafka O11 producer is interesting because it's the first time that this, that the Kafka, the Flink Kafka producer gives you exactly once processing guarantees. Um, Implementation-wise, we piggyback on the newly um, introduced um, Kafka transact transactions to achieve that. And by using now the uh, Kafka consumer as well as the, the Kafka producer, you can uh, build end-to-end uh, -end exactly uh, once processing uh, pipelines with it, which is uh, a really, really nice thing. And uh, yeah, finally, it will be available. Um, the talk with probably the best title, I think, um, will cover this topic. Um, so hit me, baby, just one time, building end-to-end -end exactly once applications with Flink by Piotr Nowerski um, will cover this topic. Uh, and it's um, going to be given at 3, uh, 20 p.m. today at Palais Atelier. <coughs> All right, so one big working thread uh, uh, of this release cycle is um, that we wanted to improve operational robustness because, um, yeah, we heard from, from customers, from users, um, that there are still some, some rough edges which could benefit some polishing, and we, we try to address them um, with this release. So, um, first of all, we dropped Java 7 support, um, which is only relevant for the Flink developers, um, because now, uh, as a Flink developer or contributor, um, you can use all the nice Java 8 features uh, when developing Flink, like Lambdas, um, Java Streams, or um, Java Futures, for example. Then, uh, another thing which many users await is that uh, we want to add support for Scala 2.12, and uh, also, uh, we move support for Scala to 10, which is um, quite outdated by now. The thing most people complain about uh, is actually that Flink comes with a lot of uh, dependencies. And especially if your user code puts in some other dependencies, um, it 
quite often happens that you run into uh, dependency conflicts and uh, you quickly find yourself in the so-called dependency hell. Um, we wanted to um, mitigate this problem or even solve it by, first of all, offering um, a child-first class loader, which, unlike the, the Java class loader, tries first to find the dependency in, a, in the child class loader, and only if, not, uh, if it's not possible to find the dependency, it asks the parent class loader. That way, it basically gives precedence to the user dependencies um, over the, the system dependencies. And that should um, help to solve most of um, the the, the um, class loading issues. Um, that's what we hope, at least. Then uh, we try to decrease the dependency footprint of Flink um, further by relocating more um, dependencies. So now um, ASM, Guava, Jackson, and Netty are completely relocated and shouldn't be visible anymore um, when, when developing Flink uh, applications. And another thing is, we try to remove the Hadoop dependency, the mandatory Hadoop dependency from Flink, because Hadoop itself puts in a lot of dependencies. Um, and um, we basically, what, we, what we're doing is we make um, the Hadoop uh, dependency optional. So if you want to use Flink with Yarn or Access um, HFS, then you, you um, add this dependency. But if not, then you are not bothered by all the dependencies which come with uh, Hadoop. <coughs> all right so much for uh, some of the features uh, of the next release. Now let's take a look at uh, what's beyond. So, first of all, um, we want to... Um, I mean, I, I've talked about the site outputs, which we've, which we've added with 1.3, um, and the counterparts are the site inputs, um, which you want to add uh, in 1.5 or later. So site inputs um, have the idea that you, you specify additional inputs to, um, for your um, process functions, uh, and you can assign um, special semantics to it. And with that, you can do things like um, properly join uh, an incoming stream with a static data set, for example. You could use these inputs to um, feed a continuously refined machine learning model to your operator which then is used for prediction there, or do um, proper window joins. All this um, development is, uh, or this, this, the site inputs um, are proposed um, as part of the um, Flink Improvement Proposal 17, and there is a design document uh, discussing uh, the semantics and the, and the implementation details, which you find under this link here. <coughs> As I've said, um, state is one of the uh, key distinctive features of Flink, and so we take it really serious, um, seriously what you can do with state and how um, the state management works in Flink, uh, and especially uh, how you can evolve your state which you've put into Flink. Um, one first step to, to um, achieve that is eager state decl declaration. Um, currently, um, how you... Um, interact with state is you, you uh, register it at one time, basically. But in the future, uh, especially um, for the system, it might be helpful. Uh, it will be helpful that um, you have, have knowledge about which state is uh, part of which um, user function. And that's what actually eager state declaration is about. So um, you will have some annotations where you specify the state fields, the state types, and the serializers. And this gives the, the system um, all the knowledge it, knows, it, it needs to reason about um, whether like state migration is needed or if, if for example, um, yeah, in case you want to add uh, a field to your, to your schema or um, when you've noticed that your, your serializer you've used is actually um, too inefficient and um, there's some, some improvement po uh, potential. That uh, will be possible um, based, with this, uh, based on this uh, eager state declaration um, as, as one of the first steps. Um, there's, since state management and evolution is such an important topic, there's also a dedicated talk um, for it, which is called Managing State in Apache Flink by Tsuli Tai. Uh, today at 4.30, uh, where we will um, talk about what's already possible, what are the pitfalls, and uh, what will you be able to do in the future. <coughs> Another um, really cool feature is um, state replication. So 
um, at the moment, um, the state for, for uh, each key is only kept on a single task manager. So whenever this, this task manager fails, um, you basically have to, to recover the state from a persistent store, which is usually um, ATFS or S3. So um, it requires some network communication. And depending on the size of the state, this might be quite costly and uh, take a while. So in order to, to um, mitigate this problem, um, we uh, think about um, replicating uh, the state such that it's stored not only on a single task manager, but multiple. So you have like the, the um, task manager containing the original state, and it could work that whenever you do change uh, state changing operations, that it um, generates <coughs> um, like uh, a change log stream, which is consumed by other task managers to, to construct the replica of the state. Uh, and that way you will have multiple task managers um, keeping a replica of the state. And if now a task manager fails, you can simply redeploy the, the um, failed task to a task manager, which contains a replica, uh, and then it can locally recover um, the state. And as a um, side effect, this would also help to implement high throughput queryable state, because uh, you can now um, query multiple task managers to answer um, a state query. And this brings me to uh, the last um, feature I want to present uh, for the future, which is the programmatic job control. Uh, many people complained about that it's not so easy to control flink jobs from within a program. So for example, to launch multiple um, jobs or to simply trigger a save point um, from within your program. And uh, this will also uh, help um, implementing better testing facilities. So how this could look like is uh, the following. Uh, I mean, we, it could be that you uh, have a, a job client and a cluster client doing exactly these operations. So um, inst instead of... Um, <coughs> so how it usually works is you get your stream execution environment, define your program, and when you call execute, it blocks there doesn't do anything and waits for um, the job execution result. That's how it works right now. And especially in the case of a streaming application, which is long running, this is not so useful. So instead, what we, what's thinkable is that you uh, get a job client, which is bound to a job, which can be used to trigger all kinds of, of um, job-related operations. For example, taking a save point, um, getting the result future, canceling the job, um, and, and this gives you uh, much more control um, over, uh, over your job. Um, and the cluster client can be, is connected to the cluster on which the job is running uh, and can be used to query, for example, um, the, the currently running jobs on it uh, or launch new jobs. And that's basically uh, how, how it could, be, could look like in the future, uh, a programmatic job control. This brings me to my last slide. So. Um, what have you seen today? Uh, I hope um, what you should take away from this uh, talk is that um, Flink has a, a ton of cool features. There will be a ton of new cool features coming. So please stay tuned. Um, uh, follow um, the, like subscribe to the news uh, mailing list, to the user mailing list. Follow uh, us on Twitter to keep uh, posted. Um, and if you want to learn more about the, the individual features, then please visit one of the, uh, the depth um, talks which will uh, take place today and tomorrow and yeah that's all thanks a lot for your attention and if you have questions uh, feel free to ask them now <laughs> guys, guys want to go to lunch. Hmm? Yeah, everybody wants them to go to the lunch so <laughs> yeah <laughs> just a quick question uh, regarding the Class loading issues. Have you considered some existing technologies to resolve the problem, like NetBeans modules, OSGI, or I don't know. Every open source project probably de develops one class loader. So, do you have, have any knowledge of, or uh, are we going to expect in other open source solutions from Flink? Like? Um, I, I'm not too familiar with uh, the solutions of other projects, to be honest. Um, the the um, proposed or the presented solution with the um, first uh, like child first class order is actually quite simple uh, and um, also 
I think not too far fetched as a solution. Um, so um, I think that we will cover or that this can cover most of it. Uh, the problem is a bit in, in um, Flink's architecture that it's um, due to how it has grown. It's not so easy to um, to to uh, separate. Um, user code and the, the uh, system uh, dependencies. Uh, that's basically where everything originates from. Um. I, I, I don't know how, how they did it, but in Apache NiFi there is a class loader when they can run different version of the same library for my user code. For example, I have two modules which I have developed and I have different versions of the libraries and different versions of my module running. Maybe let's take a look into and merge mm -hmm. some code. Um, that, that's a good pointer uh, to, to check out if it's uh, compatible with um, how things work. Uh, works. Um, true. Thanks. Hi. Uh, I saw that you made the, the state replication, right? Which is a very good feature. Are you thinking also about uh, active active task deployment? So that as you already have the state replicated, you could have also, uh, let's say, passive active uh, task running and switch for high availability, for example? Um, there, are, there are no concrete plans for that yet, but that's definitely a feature which is uh, thinkable, yeah. Um, like, as you've mentioned, uh, making the failover even faster by, by having uh, a standby task running. Um, um, but, yeah, there's no one. I mean, that was also like the post 1.4 feature, so uh, um, no one currently working on it. Um, on the um, incremental checkpointing, I see that that dramatically um, would improve taking um, the checkpoint itself, but then don't you pay for that a little bit at restore time, and how do you then manage that? Because you, couldn't you end up with like hundreds of incrementals that you all have to go through before you can actually restore, or are there settings that kind of prevent that? Um, it's, it's true what you said, that uh, having these increments um, adds up on, on recovery time. Um, what we do is that, that um, once in a while a full checkpoint will be taken such that it's not a, um, like a never-ending sequence of, of increment, increments which you have to recover. Um, and the underlying assumption is that, that uh, um, compared to checkpointing, the recovery um, happens um, um, not as often. That's basically... Um, but there's no... Um, I mean. Not yet, at least, uh, a dedicated control mechanism uh, um, which, which limits like the recovery time. That's also hard to, to um, calculate, actually. Um, but yeah, that's um, a price you have to pay. <coughs> okay, then um, thanks for your attention, and I would say enjoy lunch. <laughs> See you around. <laughs>